хотел бы несколько более конкретно рассказать вкратце о некоторых результатах, которые близки мне, по крайней мере, и принадлежат э, профессору Ниренбергу. Мне кажется, что все же основное направление, э, которым занимался и занимается профессор Ниренберг, это нелинейный анализ. Поскольку основные работы профессора Нирифирга посвящены именно нелинейному анализу. Причем, как абстрактному нелинейному анализу, я имею нелинейный функциональный анализ, его глобальные аспекты, а именно теорию степени отображения и ее обобщение на нелинейные Фридгольмовы операторы. Именно вот этому обобщению, одному из направлений был посвящен вчера доклад профессора Нирипенга в университете московском, а также приложение к нелинейному уравнению. Первые уравнения, первые работы профессора Нереберга были опубликованы в 1953 году. Они были посвящены априорным оценкам решения квазилинейных уравнений. И с тех пор, по настоящее время, интерес к этой проблеме не иссякает. Последние работы, которые были опубликованы уже именно в этом году, также относятся к области нелинейных, квазилинейных, ну, квазилинейных, точнее, эллиптических уравнений второго порядка, где изучаются тонкие геометрические свойства решений, свойства симметрии положительных решений. И аналогичный сегодняшний доклад как раз будет посвящен одной из таких задач. Ну и помимо этого, все, по-видимому, ну, большинство, по крайней мере, знает вклад профессора Нирибрига в линейный анализ, в частности, в развитие теории псевдодифференциальных операторов, в создание алгебры псевдодифференциальных операторов, а также в теорию функциональных пространств. Классические интерполяционные неравенства Гольярда Ниренберга, а также неравенства Ниренберга Труази сделали и позволили сделать существенный шаг в исследовании нелинейных уравнений. Ну, может быть, я чуть конкретно скажу, я прошу прощения. Все мы знаем, речь идет о критических показателях нелинейности в эллиптических уравнениях. Все мы знаем, что в эллиптическом уравнении дельту и сефа тексу градиенту нелинейность по градиенту не может превосходить 2. Это так называемые условия Берштейна на гума квадрат. Он был получен с помощью техники барьерных функций, принципа максимума и так далее. Но в пространстве дубль 2, 2 p эта техника не работает. А вот неравенство Гальярда Неренберга работают и дают точный показатель. 2 минус n делить на p. Лучше нельзя его сделать. Есть вон примеры. Таким образом, условия... Бенштейна на Гума является предельным случаем условия, если угодно, э, Бенштейна на Гума Ниренберга. Именно точное неравенство пишется 2 минус n размерность делить на p при p больше n. Ну, еще одно направление, которое развивается и постоянно развивается, это общая разработка подходов к априорным оценкам, которых мы сегодня увидим их приложение. Но, заканчивая, я хочу сказать, что роль и влияние работ профессора Нириберга трудно переоценить. Практически в каждой статье, посвященной эллиптическим уравнениям, не только, вы всегда найдете ссылки на работы профессора Нириберга. И вот по этому количеству ссылок он занимает одно из первых мест в мире математиков. И еще одна черта. Черта заключается в следующем. 
Профессор Нерингберг публиковал, начиная, когда еще был совсем-совсем молодым, он и сейчас не очень, вот, по три работы в среднем в год. И сейчас он продолжает публиковать в среднем каждый год три новых работы, не снижает темпа. Поэтому я считаю, что мы вправе здесь приветствовать еще раз профессора Нерингберга за его не только прекрасные результаты, за его прекрасные отношения, за то, что он согласился приехать к нам и выступить с последними результатами, которые он получил, ну и поделиться своими знаниями некоторых по анализу. Спасибо. The Academy and the Steklov Institute, and to visit Moscow, and really to have the wonderful hospitality that I've had here. Uh, I must apologize. My lecture is going to be a rather elementary lecture, and I will even give some proofs. And the talk, it has to do with a kind of special problem, a geometric problem, and it is joint work with Yen Yen Li. <coughs> But at the heart of the work is the maximum principle. Now, uh, I'm sure most of you remember the maximum principle that say harmonic functions take their maximum on the boundary. And for general second order elliptic the operators, there's, there are maximum principles. And they have, there are different forms of maximum principle. And I'm going to use one particular form as well as what's called the Hopf lemma. And the geometric problem that I'm going to describe, it, to me, its main interest is that it suggests the need to generalize the Hopf lemma. And there will be some open problems in, in my talk. So let me first recall the strong maximum principle. So it refers to a, a, an elliptic operator L. So L u equal u is a function in some domain, a real function in the domain omega. Domain means open connected. <clears throat> and it satisfies an elliptic op the following elliptic operator with variable coefficients. And it satisfies an inequality. And the operator is supposed to be elliptic. In fact, I will always assume uniformly elliptic, meaning that the coefficients, this matrix is uniformly positive definite. For all vectors c and uh, some fixed positive constant c. So it's uniformly elliptic. And the other coefficients are assumed to be bounded. And the strong maximum principle, I don't know if you can read down here, perhaps not. I'll write it here. The strong maximum principle says the following. If u is non-negative and lu is less than or equal to zero, if u vanishes at some point for some x0, <clears throat> then u is identically 0. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the strong maximum principle. And the, uh, I should point out in this principle, one does not assume anything about the sign of this coefficient. Can, coefficient can do anything at once. <clears throat> and related to the strong maximum principle is the Hopf lemma. And that says again, u is non-negative, <clears throat> lu is less than or equal to zero, and u vanishes at a boundary point. Let's say this is smooth. 
<coughs> then the conclusion is either u is identically 0, or the interior normal derivative is po at that point is positive. Here's the domain. Here's the point x0. And you, that's the normal direction. And either the function is identically 0, or its normal derivative is positive. <coughs> So, sorry? Not, omega is bounded. No, it's, it's not necessary. Not necessary. No. The, uh, in this form, the theorem was first published by Eberhard Hopf in 19, I think 1928. And, and this one was published by him again in 1952. However, it is already implicit in the earlier paper. And it, it, the Hopf lemma is really the heart of the maximum principle. If you look at the proof of the maximum principle, it has in it the Hopf lemma. So I'm going to use both of these, but I'm going to use them for nonlinear elliptic problems. And the statement for nonlinear, which I'll write down, are immediately corollaries of the linear statement. So here's a nonlinear statement. <clears throat> I'm going to have to erase. So nonlinear. By the way, please uh, feel free to ask questions or interrupt or make comments because it's really a very elementary lecture, and I will give some proofs of some things in the lecture as well as state some open problems. So nonlinear is this: you have a nonlinear second-order operator. And you have, so this is a non elliptic, <coughs> I'll assume uniformly elliptic or strongly elliptic. <coughs> that means that if you take the derivative of f with respect to its second derivatives, this is uniformly positive, x i, x j, this is uniformly positive definite. some positive constants. C and, the, and F is, let's say, smooth, just to <coughs> be simple. Assume F is smooth in its arguments and uniformly elliptic in that sense. Then the strong maximum principle compares two functions. It says, suppose you have, so this is strong maximum principle. Suppose you have two functions, one of which is larger than the other. And they satisfy the following inequality. And the statement is, if u equals v at some point, x0 in omega, then u is identically equal to v. And you prove it just from the linear strong maximum principle. You look at u minus v. You, you, you apply a theorem of the mean. It satisfies a linear expression with an inequality. You apply the linear strong maximum principle. You get the result. It looks like a very fancy result, but it's just a concept immediately corollary of the linear strong maximum principle. Is there something not clear? Yes, my writing is not clear. So again, I'll repeat. You have two function larger than another. They satisfy this kind of inequality. And at some point, they are equal in the domain. Conclusion, they are equal everywhere. And then also the Hopf lemma. Uh, well, let me put the Hopf lemma here. The same kind of statement with the Hopf lemma. U greater than equal to v as above, as as before, that means f with u less than or equal to f with v, and u equals v at some boundary point. Then either u is identically equal to v, or the normal derivative of u is strictly greater than the normal derivative of v, 
at that boundary point. So that's just the same conclusion is there, but it's for two <coughs> functions satisfying differential inequality. And again, it's immediate consequence of the linear Hopf-Weber. So the heart of the problem, of my discussion is going to be to use these two results for a geometric problem. And as I said, the, perhaps the interest in the problem is that it seems to indicate that one has to generalize the hopf lemma. <clears throat> so the problem starts with a, a uh, <coughs> theorem, geometric theorem, due to A.D. Alexandrov, proved in 1955. <clears throat> he was a Russian geometer, as most of you know, and he proved the following theorem, a very beautiful theorem. <clears throat> if you have a, <clears throat> an n-dimensional compact <clears throat> hypersurface embedded in Rn plus 1, so something like, I don't know, something like that. <clears throat> and the assumption is that the, the mean curvature, which is the average of principal curvatures, is a constant. So you take at any point a normal, there's an interior. This is M. It's a hypersurface. It bounds something. You take the interior normal. You compute the principal curvatures <coughs> of the hypersurface. And then the mean curvature, H, It's the average <coughs> of the sum of the principal curvatures. And the assumption is it's constant. So it's the same at every point. Conclusion, H is a sphere. Uh, sorry, uh, M is a sphere, thank you. Yes. Uh, for some years, people wondered about this condition. Does it have to be embedded? Can you allow self-intersection? And then in 1980-something, I don't remember, uh, 1986, a counter example was given by Wente Uh, he constructed a two-dimensional torus in three space with self-intersection, which has constant mean curvature. Very curious construction. So two I won't write. Two-dimensional torus, self-intersection with constant mean curvature. But I want to talk about this theorem. And uh, what I propose to do, I would like to show you the proof of this theorem, of Alexandrov's proof, because it's a very beautiful proof. And then I want to show you what Yan Yan Li and I have been trying to do to extend this proof under more general conditions. <clears throat> okay. The heart of the proof is to prove that the, so the, the, the main idea of the proof is this. You choose some direction in Rn plus 1. Let me call it the Xn plus 1 direction. And here is our hypersurface. It need not, the interior need not be uh, so simple, but anyway, I, I draw it very simply. And uh, I guess there is no color chalk here. This looks like white chalk. No. What, uh, what uh, Alexandrov did, he introduced in this paper the method of moving planes. It's a method that has been used very successfully in recent years by a number of people for different kinds of problems, but he introduced it in this problem. And it's the following. He, he takes a 
a plane xn plus 1, what he's going to prove, before I should say that, what he's going to show is you choose a direction and you want to show that there is some plane xn plus 1 equals some constant so that the surface is symmetric about that plane. So that's how the proof goes. You show that there is some plane given a direction. You, there's a plane perpendicular to that direction so the, sur the hypersurface is symmetric about that plane. Since the direction is arbitrary, it follows that the surface is a sphere. If you have symmetry about every such plane, then the surface is a sphere. So this is the main step. And how he does that is to use the method of moving planes, which I'll describe here. I'll draw a rather simple picture, just so I say here's the surface, and it looks something like that. And uh, let me make it even simpler. Let's say it looks like that. And uh, he t this is the xn plus 1 direction. <coughs> he takes a plane xn plus 1 equals some constant, but the plane lies very near the top of the surface. And then he reflects the part on top in the plane. So it's too bad we don't have a different color chalk. He reflects that piece in the plane. And now it, it, the reflection lies inside the interior of this body. The, the, the hypersurface bounds some body. And the reflection, if you're near the top, the reflection lies inside the interior. Then he moves down the plane until you reach a point so that if you go fur further, the reflection does not lie anymore in the interior. You go as far as you can. And then there are two possibilities. So case one is something like this. Here's the reflection. And it's touching here. And it looks like that. Unfortunately, there's no color chalk, so I'll draw, I'll draw the reflection sort of like that. So he moves down the plane until the reflection of the top part in the plane can no longer go further. This is case one. It, it touches the rest of the surface at a point which is not on the plane. So that's case one. Case two is a different picture. Uh, this is the original surface. I've moved down the plane and I reach a point where the reflection is just tangent to the surface here. And if I go further, I will go outside, possibly outside. And this is a, I stop there. And in each case, I want to show that the reflected part is the part below, in each case. <clears throat> if, we, if there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt. And also, if I don't speak loudly, well, there's a microphone. If I don't write large enough or clearly enough, please uh, tell me. It's clear for you. But what about the people in the back <laughs> row? <laughs> so I'm going to show you that this part is the same as that part. And the proof uses the strong maximum principle. Namely, I take some coordinates which I call x prime, which are x1 to xn. Here is xn plus 1. And I describe the graph of this reflected thing as the, the distance from some such plane, horizontal plane. I call that u. That's u of x prime. So if I go up to, and I take the graph. And if I go up to the original unreflected part, up to here, that's v of x prime. So u is greater than or equal to v. But the, the mean curvature here 
which is the same as it's re under reflection, mean curvature doesn't change. So the mean curvature here is constant. It's equal to the mean curvature here. But there's a simple analytic expression for the mean curvature in terms of the function u. Here is the mean curvature. This is for u. That's the mean curvature. And that's equal to the mean curvature of v. They're, they're constant. So the same expression with v. So I have two functions, u greater than or equal to v. <coughs> this, uh, this is an elliptic operator. It's nonlinear. This elliptic operator on u is equal to the elliptic operator on v. In fact, it's constant. And u equals v at an interior point right here. Conclusion, u is identically equal to v. That's just the strong maximum principle. So that's a strong max principle. <clears throat> what about this picture? This is the more interesting picture. I want to show you that this part is the same as that part. Well, if I try to introduce coordinates to the graph here where they touch, where they're tangent, the, the slopes are infinite. So what you do is you take this and you turn it around. Just physically, if I had transparency, I would simply turn the transparency around. So I'm going to turn around this picture, which I don't do very well. But Here's one, and here's the other. Uh, so here they are tangent. Xn plus 1 is going in this direction. And I introduce suitable coordinates so that the, the tangent to the surface is sort of coming out like this. And here I introduce coordinates relative the graph relative to some coordinates here, which I'll call maybe y, y prime. And here the graph is u, and here the graph is v, up to the original surface is v. I have the same inequal, I have the same identity, mean curvature is the same. u is greater than or equal to v in this region to the right here. And at a boundary point, u is v, and they have the same tangent by the Hopf lemma, if their derivatives are the same, u must be identically v. That was the Hopf lemma. Either the normal derivatives are different or the functions are the same. So here they're tangent, so that they are the same. So a Hopf lemma, u identically equal to v. So this must coincide with that. And that's Alexandrov's proof. Very simple argument. It just uses strong maximum principle and the Hopf lemma. So some years ago, uh, so, sorry. Yes, and then you just extend. Once you have it local, then you extend it just using strong maximum principle, all the way. Yeah. The main step is to get beyond this, uh, beyond here, and then you extend using the strong maximum principle. Yes. Yeah, well, I've rotated the picture, and I have new coordinates, which I call horizontal coordinates. And there's a vertical coordinate corresponding to minus xn plus 1, which is that, not that. This, this is minus xn plus 1. And the, the u and the v in this picture, they're the distance from the tangent plane. That's u, and this is the v. But I've rotated it. I've rotated the picture. So this is distance u, this is distance v at the same point. I've drawn them a little di different. And they satisfy the same identity, same elliptic operator e equality. And at the boundary point, which is where we're in this region here, in the boundary point, they agree and their normal derivative agrees. Their first derivatives agree. No. No, I'm trying to prove that, that this piece is the same as that. And I'm trying, the v is the, is, the, is the graph height for that. 
and u is for that, and what I'm showing you is that u equals v. Therefore, this piece and this piece are the same. And then you just continue with strong maximum principle and you find the same everywhere. So here the whole point is the Hopf lemma. Now in, in 1997, uh, Yen Yen Li said, maybe one can prove monotonicity of a, of a hypersurface with some condition on the mean curvature, namely that it is perhaps monotone if you choose a direction and if you go from one point on the hypersurface to another up, the, the, the mean curvature decreases. Maybe you have symmetry anyway. So let me express the problem this way. So now the assumption is going to be different. So this is Yen Yen Li. I shouldn't write theorem, but rather a question. He said, suppose here we have a hypersurface embedded in Rn plus 1, and we, with the following hypothesis, that if we take any two points that lie on the hypersurface, one above the other, meaning if you move up in the Xn plus 1 direction, you hit the other. And the main hypothesis should be that H at the upper point is less than or equal to H at the lower point. Question, is M symmetric about some plane Xn plus 1 equals some constant? Is there symmetry? So here we're not assuming that H is constant, but rather it's decreasing as you go up it's decreasing, at least less than or equal to. Do you have symmetry? And he proved in 1997 that the answer is yes. Yes, provided the mean curvature H, which is defined on the surface, can be extended to all of space, all of Rn plus 1, as a Lipschitz function which is decreasing in the xn plus 1 direction. So provided H admits a Lipschitz, uh, my writing gets worse as I go down. Uh, I want to keep this picture. Uh, who is uh, this result? Or this result? Yes. yes, that's Yen Yen Li. So, Again, I repeat, uh, the answer is yes, provided you can extend H as a Lipschitz function to all those space, which is decreasing in the n, n plus 1 direction. So H sub xn plus 1 less than or equal to 0. So if that's true, then, you can, then the answer is yes, you have symmetry. But he asked, what if you don't, cannot extend H? Do you have symmetry? And the answer is no. You don't have symmetry. Let me give you a simple counterexample. So I'm, I, since we don't have much space, I will erase here. So I repeat the question. You have a surface, and when you have a fixed direction, and if, whenever you go up from one point on the surface to another, there might be many points, the mean curvature is always non-increasing. Do you have symmetry about some plane? The answer is no, and here is a one-dimensional example, a curve. So the answer to his question is no in general, and here is a curve in two dimensions. I'll draw it. Looks like that. Piece coming out like that. <clears throat> this is x2. The mean if you go up from any point to a point above, the mean curvature is the same. I have this is just symmetric to that. Here, these are flat vertical pieces. This is symmetric about here. This is symmetric about there. So the mean curvature, as you move up, doesn't change. But of course, this, this is not symmetric. <clears throat> so we thought we should add a condition, a natural condition. So let me add a condition. S, I'll call it S. Any 
uh, hyperplane, any vertical hyperplane. By vertical, I mean it contains a line parallel to the xn plus 1 axis. Any vertical hyperplane tangent to the surface is a plane of support. That means the surface lies on one side of it. That's, that's not the case here. Here is a tangent plane, and the surface, there's part here, there's part there. That excludes this picture. So here's a conjecture. Uh, assume the main condition, I'll call this the main condition, h of a is less than or equal to h of b. If whenever you move up, there's b a, the mean curvature decreases as you go up. So that's the main condition. Assume that and condition s, this condition. Then <coughs> then there is symmetry. We have not been able to prove that. So that's the first open problem I'm stating. If you assume that condition, monotonicity, and this condition about planes of support, vertical planes being planes of support, we believe that one has symmetry, but we don't know how to prove it. So we added another condition. <coughs> so add condition <coughs> T which says any line <coughs> parallel to the xn plus 1 axis. Let me erase this draw drawing since I will never use it again. <coughs> so any, any line parallel to the xn plus 1 axis, which is tangent to the manifold, has contact, sorry, you cannot read, of finite order. That is, it touches it, but just a finite order. So it doesn't touch inf infinite, not all derivatives match, just a finite order. So that's an additional condition, conjecture. So this is conjecture one. Conjecture two, uh, main condition, condition S and T imply symmetry. So we're at, it's a weaker conjecture. The main condition was the monotonicity of the mean curvature. As you go from any point on the hypersurface to a point above it, the mean curvature doesn't increase. That's the main condition. <clears throat> so we added this new condition, and conjecture two, we have symmetry. Well, we don't have a proof of that either. So, yes? Sorry, is it true for any equals two? Oh, yeah, I should say something. The original conjecture was true for n equals one, for curves. I forgot to say that. For curves, the original conjecture is true. n equals two, we don't know. But n equals one for curves, you have symmetry. And the proof is not very hard. So we had another uh, condition. For instance, this, this condition is automatically satisfied if the surface is analytic. It's a closed surface, so you'll always have contact of finite order. So that's automatic. This condition is automatic. T is automatic if the surface, hypersurface is an analytic one. But we add still another condition which is a kind of convexity condition. And for, in order to save time, maybe I won't state the third condition. Or maybe I will state. So a third condition. Uh, yeah. I'll call it C. 
see which is uh, uh, so near if you have a vertical <coughs> hyperplane tangent to m at some point, say, uh, some point, p, then near p, the distance from m to the plane, hyperplane, is convex in the xn plus 1 direction. I should say that con the condition T, where is the T? The condition S implies that the, the um, interior of the, 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 the surface bounds a region. The interior of the region is convex in the xn plus 1 direction. For instance, it can look like this. It can look like that. Of course, like that, of course, like that. So this doesn't have to be con convex here, but in this direction, it's necessarily convex. So uh, we've a we added this extra condition, and then we have a theorem. All these conditions imply symmetry. <clears throat> so we're not satisfied with this theorem because we have too many conditions. But I would like to show you how we attack the theorem. And the method of attack is Alexandrov's method, the method of moving planes. So we start with a, a plane that it lies near the top. We reflect the top of the surface until we can no longer reflect and we have either this picture or that picture. <clears throat> I claim that in this picture, this reflected piece is the same as there. Again, I look at the graphs, u of x and v of x. Of course, the mean curvatures are no longer constant. But the v lies below the corresponding point u, so the mean curvature here is greater than or equal to the mean curvature there. That's the hypothesis, main condition. So in here, we have an inequality. But we can apply the strong maximum principle. U, U is greater than or equal to V. You have elliptic inequality. And U equals V at a point in this picture. Therefore, U is identically V. So that argument is just the same, strong maximum principle. The interesting part is this part, the Hopf lemma. What happens to the Hopf lemma? So I turn the picture around, and maybe I'll draw a bigger picture so you see it more clearly. So I just take this picture, I turn it. I have this original surface lying like this, something like that. And the reflected surface. And they're tangent here. These are, this is, I take a plane which is tangent to the tangent to the, the tangent plane to the surface. That's this plane. This is some direction, whatever it is. And I have. I, I, I draw the, the U here, the height U. Uh, I should make a bigger. <clears throat> so this is U up to the reflected surface, and here's V <clears throat> up to the original surface. And what does the condition say? The condition says that <clears throat> the mean curvature at such a point is less than or equal to not the mean curvature here, but the mean curvature here. I've turned the picture. Xn plus 1 is in that direction. To move in the positive x1 direction means to go like that. So the statement is, if you have two points on the original surface here and the reflected surface, <coughs> the, where the, the, the heights are the same, but the, the, there are different points. 
And the hypothesis is the mean curvature at this, of u at this point is less than or equal to the mean curvature at another point. Is there a Hopf lemma? So that's the first main question. Is there a kind of Hopf lemma where you're comparing two functions at different points? And so uh, what, we, the first, what we did is what every mathematician does. Of course, we look at a very simple model problem. But first, I should say we don't know the answer to that. We don't know if there is such a Hopf lemma. So we looked at some very simple one-dimensional model problem. In fact, I, I want to mention that in uh, Courant Institute, we have a, uh, a lounge on the 13th floor. 13 is considered an unlucky number in the United States. And from the lounge, you have balconies. People can step out of the balcony. And I was always worried that some student may jump off the balcony. So I thought we should post signs on the doors of the balcony, such as, have you looked at the two-dimensional case? And such signs. So we, here, what we looked at a one-dimensional, very simple model problem. So let me write down that problem. <clears throat> so I'm not going to show you the proof of this theorem because it's rather long. And I prefer to show you the model problems and some open, other open problems. So here's a one-dimensional model problem. I have functions of one variable, u and t, u and v, u greater than or equal to v, which are positive on, say, t between 0 and 1, say. Sorry. Uh, u sub t is positive. So here's, here's t, functions of one variable. Here is u, it's an increasing function. And here is v, lies below u, it may oscillate something. This is u, this is v. <coughs> and the main hypothesis, main condition, is <coughs> wherever u of t equals v of s, t less than s, there, the second derivative of u is less than or equal to the second derivative at s. So I'll draw a picture. Here's some point t. And at, here's a point s, where v has the same value as u of t. And so at this point, I'm assuming that the second derivative of v is greater than or equal to the second derivative of u. So there are different points, where points where the u and v have the same value. Question, is u equal to v? Oh, I forgot to say that at the origin, excuse me, u equals v equals u sub t, u sub t equals 0 at the origin. So the way I've drawn it, they're tangent to each other at the origin. So it's a, it looks like as though there should be a Hopf lemma. You have two things that are tangent. But there, there's a differential inequality. But it's not at the same points. It's where the functions have the same values. Is u equal to v? Well, the answer is yes. <clears throat> and it took us several months to find the proof. And we only know one proof, which I would like to show you. It's an elementary proof, but I would like to show you the proof. But before I do that, I just want to say the higher dimensional analog, which I'll write down, is still open. We don't know the answer to the higher dimensional problem. Let me just write. I want to keep that. So, so let me just say higher dimensions. We have u greater than or equal to v on for uh, 0 less than 0 less than t less than 1, and some other variables, y uh, in r, r, k, y, say less than 1. But these are functions of t and y.
and they're positive. And <clears throat> at the origin at t equals zero, they vanish. U equals v equals zero equals u sub t equals v sub t. And also for t positive, u sub t is positive. So the picture looks something like this, except we have more variables, some y variables which are coming out like this. And the main condition where, can you see down here? In the back, can you see here? Maybe not. Uh, so let me write it up here. Well, though I want to keep that, so I'll write it here, the main condition here. <coughs> So where u of t y equals v of s y, t u s of s, there Laplacian of u is less than or equal to Laplacian of v. <coughs> Question: Is u equal to v? So that's the higher dimensional analog of this fact of which I'm going to show you the proof. And we don't know the answer to this question. So I don't know if it's true or false. I just, I just don't know. <clears throat> Very so simple. Yes. Yes, first so derivative. That's right. So I, that's why I drew V uh, sort of oscillating. No condition on the derivative of V. Yeah, no condition on the derivative of V. Right. I'm going to prove that, the one-dimensional statement I'm going to prove for you, if I have time. And I think I, yes, I have time. So, no, it's not out. It's okay. Well, there's this condition. No, no, that's the condition. The condition is, the, oh, I didn't write the claim? Ah, sorry. Excuse me, claim. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Uh, senility comes with age. So, yes. So you have this is a hypothesis. Wherever you have a point, points t and s, where u and v have the same values, there the secondary derivative of u is less than or equal to the Second derivative of v. Conclusion, u is identically v. And here is the corresponding question in higher dimensions, and we don't know the answer. So I would like to show you the proof of this one dimensional result. So maybe I'll erase this. Well, maybe. Uh, we didn't do it that way. But in fact, our proof is, is a kind of funny proof, you will see. And it's the only proof I know. Maybe there is a proof with, with Taylor formula. But uh, anyway, I'll show you the, our proof. So here's the proof for this one-dimensional model problem. <clears throat> it's a very funny proof. It says, since u sub t is positive. I should re remark, you, you cannot give up this condition. If you just, just a side remark, if you just assume u sub t is greater than or equal to zero, then it's not true. Because u can look like this. And v, if I had different color chalk, this is u. And v could follow u until here then move to the right horizontally, and then follow u to the side, v. At every point where u and v have the same values, the second derivatives are the same. But u is not v. But, so this is essential condition. We cannot drop that condition. <coughs> OK, so here is the proof. Since uc is positive, 
uh, u is a function of t, we can think of t as a function of u. Just that ut is positive. And so look at ut t. It's a function of t, t is a function of u. So it's a function of u, an unknown function of u. So u satisfies such a differential equation with an unknown function. The f is smooth for positive values of the argument because u sub t there is positive. But near the origin, f need not be smooth. In particular, f need not be Lipschitz. For example, u might be t cubed. And so u double dot is 6, u to the 1 third. So there's an example, for instance. Mm. So u satisfies a differential, mysterious differential equation. What does this condition mean? Well, let me compute v double dot at a point. V, well, double, I'll use the, the dots. V double dot, <coughs> it's greater than or equal to the second derivative of u, where v has the same value as u. There, the second derivative is f of u, but f of u is f of v. So v double dot satisfies this. It's a subharmonic solution. That's what the main condition means. No more, no less than that. But this f is an unknown function. You just know that it's smooth for positive values of the argument and it's continuous up to zero. But otherwise, you know nothing about f. And I want to show that, and I draw the picture again, they both start at the origin and they're tangent to each other. They have zero derivative at the origin. This is v, this is u. I want to show that u equals v. So the first, <coughs> there is a, a Pavlov dog reaction. If you have a differential equation, a solution and a sub-solution, in between there is a solution. So suppose that, <coughs> that v at some point b is less than u at b. I'm trying to show you that they're identical. Suppose at some point b, you have inequality. <coughs> then between u and v, there is a solution. There exists w, which satisfies w double dot equals f of w. And it lies between u and v. Oh, and I prescribe boundary conditions. w at the origin is 0, and w at b is v of b. So w, if I had a different color, looks something like this. And at b, it, it coincides with, with v. Do you mean something like a Schauser? Well, if, if f were Lipschitz, then there's a standard monotone iteration procedure to construct a solution between a so-called super solution and sub solution. Here is, in fact, we have a solution. Here is a sub-solution. I claim there's a solution in between. This fact is true if f is barely continuous. But why, why w is not u? Because its boundary value is the same as the boundary value of, of v, which is b, which is, let, I choose that boundary value. Yeah. So, so whenever you see sub and super-solution, immediately your reaction should be in between, there is a solution with, with boundary values that you can prescribe in between. So there is a solution. So now we have two solutions. So we have u double dot and w double dot equals f of w. And now I'm going to show you that u is equal, uh, that is, I'm going to claim that u is equal to w by an exercise. So here's an exercise on, say, 0 less than t less than equal 1, we have u and w satisfy <coughs> u double dot equals f of u, w double dot equals f of w. <coughs> they are both positive, or t positive, and uh, at, at the origin, they are 0. And they have the same Cauchy data at the origin. And f 
is continuous and locally Lipschitz, so f of some argument rho is continuous and locally Lipschitz for rho positive. Conclusion, u is w. So this is an exercise that one could have in a book in ordinary differential equations. So an example, for example, u equals t cubed, so u double dot is six, u to the one third. That is the only positive solution of that with zero Cauchy data. That should be in a book, but it's not in any book as far as I know. So this is the exercise. You have two positives, it's important that they're positive and uh, they, they are zero at the origin and have the same Cauchy data and F is just locally Lipschitz away from origin. Conclusion, U equals W. Uh, so please hand in your solutions to Professor Pokhozhayev at any convenient time. So if there are graduate students here, it's a nice exercise for them. So that exercise then says that u equals w, and that means that v equals w, because I assume that v at, at the end, right end point was different from u, and I took for w the value at the right end point equal to v. So that proves this one-dimensional statement. And to my mind, it's a kind of crazy proof. Why should it use sub and super solution? Why should it? It's a, a very strange proof to me. There should be a simpler, more direct proof and perhaps a proof that works in n dimensions. So, uh, I still have maybe have five minutes left. Yeah. So I would like to mention, uh, in, in trying to, to go back to the Hoff lemma and trying to, to prove in, in this higher dimensional example that I wrote down, let me go back to this higher dimensional problem. <coughs> U of ty greater than the V of ty positive for t positive. So here t is between zero and so one, y is one. And uh, U at, at t equals zero, U equals V equals zero, equals U sub t equals V sub t equals zero. And main condition where wherever u of ty equals v of sy for t of s of s, there the Laplacians satisfy this inequality. <clears throat> and the question was, is u equal v? And as I said, we don't know uh, whether it's true. We can prove it. If, so the answer is yes, <coughs> provided u and v vanish <coughs> on, uh, on uh, t0 of finite order in t. So if you expand in t, here's a t variable, there's some other variables, and uh, as functions of t, they start off with, they don't, all, not all derivatives vanish at the origin, all, not all t derivatives vanish. In that case, we can prove it. And the proof is a, uses a kind of Hopf lemma argument, which I won't sketch, but it leads to another question, so I'd like to pose this open question, which we don't know how to solve. In particular, if they vanish of infinite order, we don't know how to prove it. If, if one vanishes of infinite order, if only one vanishes of infinite order, we don't know how to prove it. But it's led to the following question. Suppose you have two functions, u of t, y, and let's say w of t, y. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm saying it incorrectly. You have one function. <coughs> Here's the t-axis. Here's u. And u vanishes 
of infinite order on plane on t equals zero. So you have these other y variables. U is ident vanishes of infinite order in t, uh, <coughs> and it satisfies the Laplacian of u less than a constant over t squared u. <coughs> <clears throat> is u zero? So, do you have uniqueness for the Cauchy problem? You can think of u as identically zero to the left. You ha do you have unique continuation for such a differential inequality? So, is u equal? <clears throat> we don't know. If u is non-negative, yes, and that's easy to show. So, it's true. If u is greater than or equal to zero, but that's a kind of Hopf lemma, which is easy to show. And I would like to conclude by a, a known fact, which I found interesting, which I just learned recently, which is this. I'll write it perhaps here. If you have a function in the neighborhood of the origin in Rn, say a smooth function. It's a unique continuation result, which I'm about to state, which is a known result. It says u smooth near origin in Rn and, and vanishes of infinite order at the origin. And satisfies the inequality of a plus in u less than a constant over x squared u, then u is identically zero. <clears throat> if you choose, if the power is bigger than two, it's false. If it's less than two, it's a long known result. This result was open for many years and was solved just a few years ago. But I forget the names of the authors. And we're asking a kind of analogous question there, which we don't know how to prove. So I thank you for your attention. And I'll stop here. It's a kind of complicated example, which I don't remember. And I don't think people have bothered to prove other examples, to make other constructions. Uh, as far as I know, that was the only example. Wente gave that exa explicit example, and it was, I don't remember it. And I'm afraid I cannot, cannot comment. There are no some general consensus or some views about the situation with intersection? No. No, there are no general conjectures. Yeah. I should say that here I spoke about mean curvature. The theorems extend to more general f symmetric functions of the principal curvatures, such as the elementary symmetric functions of the principal curvatures. The theorem extends to that. And in fact, that was already known for Alexandrov's theorem that was extended by several people to the elementary symmetric functions. Yes, of course, then you have to have convexity. You, you assume it's positive. You assume you have a convex body in that case. Yeah. So it has to be, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a compact surface, a curvature, Gauss curvature somewhere has to be positive. And if it's constant, then it has to be positive. So it's a convex body. And so it's true in that, in that case. Yeah. Solved problem or a problem or this is a solved problem. It's a tr it's a solved problem. It's not an open problem. It, it has been proved. It has been proved. That's an open problem. Here it's module x squared, and you're vanishing at a point, and here you're vanishing on a hyperplane. You need zero Cauchy gate on a hyperplane, it should be no more difficult, but we don't know how to prove it. <clears throat>